Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, in Ahmad, who and a stain, who and a star for who, when I would be lah, he mean Sharuri and Fusina, or mean say Arti Amalina, may ya the Hilla, who fell a mudilla, who are my yudlil, who fell a hadiella, or a shadu Allah, Ilah, illa law, Wahdahu la Sharika, who, or a shadu Anna Mohammed and Abduhu, or Sulu, Sallallahu Alehi was Salem, Ya Yuheladina, Aman of Takula, Hakka to Kati. ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس أتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد all praise be to Allah from whom we seek uh, help and forgiveness we seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray and whomsoever Allah leaves astray no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one having no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is Allah's servant and messenger. O oh, ye who believe, be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves, and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. O oh, humanity, be mindful of your Creator who created you from a single soul and from it created its mate and through both uh, Allah spread countless men and women across the earth and be mindful of Allah in whose name you appeal to one another and honor your ties of kinship. Surely Allah is ever watchful over you. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah and say what is right. Allah will bless your deeds for you, forgive your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and the messenger of Allah has truly achieved a great triumph. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي so before starting today i want to be very clear in that the opinions that i state in my khutbah today are mine alone that as with any khutbah i do it as if i'm in front of a mirror and sitting in front of a mirror talking to myself and it's a message to myself first and foremost you good people just happen to be here today to hear it as well Inshallah, this is something I've been struggling with, something I've been struggling with for some time now, but something that has especially been relevant, especially given the times that we are in. So if you live in America, maybe on even planet Earth, there's a good chance that you've heard of Martin Luther King Jr., a Christian minister, activist, champion of nonviolence, the face of civil rights movement in the, in the 50s and 60s, I can go on. But if I was to ask you, what is your favorite speech of Martin Luther King's, or maybe the most important one or the most, uh, most critical one that, that we need in our time today, for some, it might be that uh, the speech of our God is marching on, the how long, not long speech that he delivered in Montgomery after a triumphant march over the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. Or for others, it might be his prophetic, I've been to the mountaintop speech that was delivered the day before his death. And these both were very great substantive speeches. But I think one could safely assume that the one that comes to mind for many, if not most, is the iconic I Have a Dream speech that was delivered at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, laced with these timeless lines, the likes of judging one not by the color of the skin, but by the content of character, and so many others. This speech, more than any other, has gone on to be taken to define MLK since his assassination in education circles and public discourse across different communities and populations. But it's not this speech that I'm here to talk about or to lift up, especially given the time that we're living in today and the world that we're living in today. It is because this speech is often used to water down or oversimplify the message of Martin Luther King Jr. to make him and his mission more palatable to us as we aspire to live in a society which for the last few decades has aspired to being colorblind. When we only make this speech definitive and reflective of his entire life and arc. We forget that at the end of 
Martin Luther King's life, he was labeled as the most dangerous black man in America by the FBI, that he became widely unpopular even amongst many of his circles and peers and communities in America, amongst the black community, amongst allies. We forget the truths that he spoke about, which may have inevitably brought about his untimely death. And we forget that when Martin said towards the end of his life that he had feared that some parts of his dream that he stated on those steps had become a nightmare. This is not the Martin that we remember that's taught to us in our school classes. Rather than the aforementioned speeches, which are all meteoric in their own respect, I would put forth his Beyond Vietnam, a time to break silence, the speech that's often called the Riverside speech, written by his fellow activist Vincent Harding and delivered at the Riverside Church in New York City to be not just his most important, but contextually most relevant to us in America today in 2021. A time that is marked and has been marked by imperial pursuits, extreme capitalism and wealth inequality, materialism, unfathomable disparity and inequalities caused by spending on that which kills versus that which saves. If you haven't seen it, I can't recommend to you enough to do so before the day is over. It is absolutely a pivotal speech that resonates word for word with what is going on in our world today. You see, at Riverside, Martin Luther King opened up to break the silence, opening his speech by saying that I've come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. A time comes when silence is betrayal, and that time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. The U.S. was in the depths of a endless war, which was not only destroying a foreign country and innocent civilians, but its own great society that it once aspired to build and that would be defined by social welfare programs and care for all. It is in that same spirit that I not only come to this space today, but invite you all to come together, especially in the light of what is in light of what is going on in our communities and our world today. So what did Martin Luther King say at Riverside? Because he knew it would come out of cost. And what were the effects? In this speech, Martin Luther King explicitly called the United States government the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. How would he react to our government's actions today in light of what had happened then and what is happening now? He called the cripplers of our society, the things that cripple our society, the giant triplets of racism, extremism, uh, extreme, mil uh, sorry, extreme uh, materialism and militarism. Nothing much seems to have changed since the 60s. Call he called out not just US imperialism, uh, but he did so in a time in Vietnam when ant the anti-communist wave was at its highest and the smears to anyone who would question what the US was doing abroad or that might even hint that they're aligning with the enemy or the other would uh, basically end any kind of political ambition or any kind of career they may have or any legitimacy. As we counsel, and he lifted up that as we counsel young men concerning military service, we must clarify for them our nation's role in Vietnam and challenge them with the alternative of conscientious objection. These are Martin's words, these aren't mine words. How do we as Muslims or Americans today live in a country where we are pushing forth young men and women to the front lines of, a, of wars that we know have no true justification or end? And he called for an awareness beyond that of how the spending abroad on these endless wars cripples the very society in which we live. That the billions that we spend on weaponry and napalm and all these things that are going there, but at the end of the day, we can't afford to provide proper health care for our citizens or even forgive student debt, that these are unattainable things. He humanized the Vietnamese. He humanized the Vietnamese and the people who were deemed other and their resistance diametrically opposite to the US action and tactics and the war and demonization. He said that we are on the side of the wealthy and the secure while we create hell for the poor, talking about the poor in this country and the poor around. How do we reflect on this as Americans today? He knew the risk. He knew the risk. He knew what it would take and what it would do to his reputation, but he did it because it was the right thing to do and because it was who he was truly. I'll quote from what he said that tells you when people had said that this isn't you, Martin, like, what are you doing? 
He said that over the past two years that I have moved to break the betrayal of my own silences and to speak from the burnings of my own heart, as I have called for radical departures from the destruction of Vietnam, many persons have questioned me about the wisdom of my path. At the heart of their concerns, this Curie, this Curie has often loomed large and loud. Why are you speaking about the war, Dr. King? Why are you joining the forces of dissent? Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. Aren't you hurting the cause of your people, they ask. And when I hear them often, though I often understand the source of their concern, I am nevertheless greatly saddened for such questions mean that the inquirers have not really known me, my commitment for my calling. Indeed, their questions suggest that they do not know the world in which they live. Do we know the world in which we live? Because Martin started to see that the world in which he lived was not the one that uh, was, was just on a black and white rhetoric. There's so much more behind it. How do we hear this today when people ask us why we would stand up to racial injustice? Why would we stand up to police brutality? Why would we stand up to militarism and discrimination against those who don't look like us when we ourselves have been doing well and we're not really affected? But what was the effect of the speech? The speech brought upon a firestorm of criticism. The likes of the New York Times and the Washington Post would say that Martin Luther King has diminished his usefulness to his cause, to his country, and to his people through a simplistic and flawed view of the situation. The donations to his organization, the SCLC, were cut off. The FBI, as I mentioned, stated that this is the most dangerous black man in America, a person who is known for championing only nonviolence. The civil rights, other civil rights leaders began to critique him. His unpopularity soared and his allies, including the likes of the Johnson administration and other white allies, went against him and started to critique him, alienating them. And so now, why would I open up this khutbah today in a Muslim space relating in some details the incidents from the life of a renowned Christian minister? Because it couldn't be, as I mentioned, more relevant to us as Muslims living in this world, specifically in America today, and given the issues we find ourselves drawn to and compelled to speak on, even if it's not the easy thing to do, not just in our silos, it's easy to make a post or to share a story when you know most of your audience thinks, looks like you, or thinks like you. But in the difficult places, among allies and friends who don't look like us, who don't think like us, we love to champion the verse of the Quran, which states that, oh, ye who believe, be, stand, uh, be firm in justice, stand up for justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it's against yourself or your parents or your kindred or your family. How often do we pause to think what it means? In our time today, simply sending thoughts and prayers or hope for peace is not enough in matters of clear injustice, both in our communities and abroad. When school children aged six to seven are shot and killed in cold blood, as was in Sandy Hook, and this nation doesn't find a conscience to ban assault weapons, thoughts and prayers and hope for peace is not enough. When homeless people are criminalized and arrested simply for their crime of not having a place to sleep, thoughts and prayers are not enough. When hospitals, refugee camps, and media outlets and homes are leveled by carpet bombs, sandwiching civilians between concrete, courtesy of our country's arms manufacturings and Israeli hands to pull the trigger, thoughts and prayers for hope and peace is not enough. When a country is unjustly invaded, and sees not just itself, but an entire region thrown into turmoil, sparking a refugee crisis, displacement and catastrophic impact on civilians, as was in Iraq. Thoughts and prayers and hope, peace, these, dial these, these dialogues and half-hearted thank yous for your service or thank you just to feel included are not enough, but they're insulting. Think about the question Martin referenced from his speech when his detractors asked, why are you as a civil rights leader getting involved in foreign policy issues? Relate it back to us. Why are you as a Texan, a Muslim American, worried about what's happening out there? Why are you as a peacemaker and a bridge builder hurting your cause by discussing the intricate situation that is Palestine and Israel? Why can't we just have a dialogue and pretend that everything is okay? when in reality it's not. But saying any of those things might put you in hot water, or so you might think. 
Since 9-11, Muslims have been conditioned and many of the other American population has been conditioned to keep your head down, to fall into a model minority trap and pick and choose your battles as deemed appropriate by the purveying system. Dr. Kamila uh, Mutman Rashad spoke of breathing in these toxins, these toxins in a toxic environment when talking about the issue of white supremacy in our Ramadan halakha just not too long ago. And we've been breathing in those toxins for some time now. Although I can center so many issues that are pressing the global Muslim and more so human community at the moment, from the Saudi created famine and blockade of Yemen to the Chinese detention, sterilization and genocide of Uyghurs to the Rohingya, uh, Rohingya of Myanmar or the Hazaras of Afghanistan and so many others. Believe me that there is not a competition or tiering at all in any of these, nor should there be because of what our public discourse is and has been for the past few weeks since Ramadan and what I aimed for in this khutbah by referencing Dr. Martin Luther King's Riverside speech, I can't in any good conscience leave out a mention of that which is happening in Palestine out of, uh, out of not just the sake of honoring that speech, but a moral duty to not remain silent given especially our place where we are in, in, in this world today. All I will say is that in light of such a horrible situation, an occupation and an ethnic cleansing of the native Palestinian population that has been going on for over a century, taking Martin Luther King's words at Riverside, as well as those of our own scripture to heart, we must not cower behind simplistic and passive rhetoric of peace, especially in spaces and partnerships where these conversations may not be welcomed or desired. Is it not in the gospel where Jesus says, I've not come to bring the peace, but the sword? Because what, what took, what it needed, what needed to be done right, what needed to be changed, took the sword, the metaphorical sword, whatever you want to call it. But we must ask ourselves, is, bridging build, is uh, building bridges over troubled and toxic water really solving anything when you know people who might not be able to cross that water or who are forced to drink from it downstream and suffer from the pollutants and the toxins? Is there really that much bliss in our ignorance? As citizens of a nation that directly funds, contributes, and enables mass oppression of a people, spending billions each year on weapons and technology that's used to kill the likes of children, while the most marginalized of this nation at home suffer, we can't separate the two and say, we can only focus here or not there. These are inextricably tied. The Navajo Nation or in Flint, Michigan, people can't get proper drinking water. Millions can't afford proper health care here. Thousands of schools and teachers can't afford to provide proper education to our youth because of what is going on abroad. Martin said the same thing in 1967 and not much has changed. As he said, a nation that continues year, and I quote, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. We have a religious and civic duty here as Muslims on this issue and allies. It's not just about maintaining the peace and the comfort. It's about changing the society for better. I have no opposition in any good conscience to building bridges to not just people within our own faith communities, but also of other faith communities, that these can be good sources of sincere growth, tolerance, and foster a genuine bond of respect and uh, that we see devoid in much of the world. I want to state that clearly. Yet when these bridges, yet these bridges though, they mustn't simply follow that simple hollow uh, notion of dialogue. I gave a sermon earlier last month to a interfaith seminary on why we need to burn, not build bridges. And I knew where I was then, I know where I am now. That this was not, a court, of course, a call to vanquish existing bridges and relations that we've built with people in other communities, but to take down what we've gotten and build something together more significant by removing that distance between us. But in order to do so, we need to not just know how to get along. We need to know how to live together by having tough conversations and disagreeing. Because when you live with somebody, when you move in with somebody, when you stay with somebody, there's going to be things that you don't like. You have to sort out your differences in order to live huma humanely. You might have those differences at the end of the day, but you are able to come to the table and talk about them. That means not just scrolling past a post someone might make saying, 
to the likes of I stand with Israel when a school has just been demolished or when someone on the opposite side spews blatant anti-Semitic slurs using the movement of anti-Zionism as a cover. This is not just for those who we disagree with or who look different from, but this is exactly also for those who might also look like us, who might say that they are our allies and hurting our cause or doing something that hurts other people. We have the obligation to stand out to both. And I wanna emphasize and re-emphasize the utmost respect and dignity that we can and must show one another regardless of our different faiths or our different identities. This respect and dignity though, is not diametrically opposed to having difficult conversations and nor should we buy into the idea that we can't peacefully and respectfully have such substantive, uncomfortable, productive conversations and not still respect one another. They are not mutually exclusive. So in regards to Palestine, now is the time to, now is not the time though, to simply just hold our hands and sing Kumbaya. Because for 2 million inmates of the world's largest open air prison in Gaza, Kumbaya isn't going to bring their dead children, their sisters, and their husbands back. It won't bring back the thousands of villages and homes that were and continue to be stolen from a settler colonial state. It won't bring back the acres upon acres of desecrated and burned olive trees or stolen land that was taken from them and their ancestors. At this time, simply saying to one another that it's better not to talk about such an issue with communities of other faith or circles who might be Christian or Jewish or other for the sake of keeping peace is anything but doing that. Saying that this is just a political issue without, uh, without any consequence for meriting a space with interfaith and religious conversations when it is anything but. Taking a trip with the likes of organizations like Shalom Hartman or as our school as part of a trip to just immerse ourselves in the land of, of the Holy Land, it will do anything but unless we ask those questions. This is not the time to sweep the discomfort under the rug, but to bring it out and to wrestle with it. As a chaplain, I've been taught and am taught continuously as much as it hurts me to first and foremost sit with and embrace the discomfort because this is literally hell for me because I struggle with it in all caps as someone who is absolutely averse to conflict is an Enneagram nine and doesn't want any discomfort, but it is necessary. I may not be there yet. We might not be there yet, but it does not mean that uh, we don't have these conversations. Because if we don't have these conversations, if we don't challenge erroneous opinions and statements and generalization, which further causes such as apartheid and ethnic cleansing, who are we standing for? What are we standing for? Surely not the oppressed or those whom Allah has list lifted up in the Quran as the mustadafun fil ard, the oppressed upon the earth, but or the downtrodden, but for the hands that keep them there. As the line in Hamilton goes, channeling Malcolm X, if you stand for nothing, what will you fall for? And it is apparent that we all not just fall, but we have fallen for so much. In the name of peace, we've sacrificed justice. And not just in regards to Palestine. Look anywhere, locally and abroad, that we'll proudly book a five-star package to Hajj or Umrah and stuff ourselves to the brim at the buffet breakfast in the Abraj Towers, but we won't think about the emaciated children in Yemen whose famine that we are perpetuating with the Saudi blockade. We'll wave Pakistan flags and emojis the moment they make a statement condemning human rights violations of another country, but go silent when they remain silent on the treatment of Uyghurs in China. We'll gladly shake hands and share meals and homes with neighbors who will seek to criminalize homeless people for sleeping on the sidewalk or a bench and not bother to even ask them about the consciousness or about it and challenge them on their belief of that. It's just too uncomfortable. Let's just keep the peace. I could go on, but alas, where would we stop? Where would we if we could stop? In the example of Martin Luther King, we just didn't have someone who put the awkwardness or discomforting issues of the same government that allied itself with his cause to the side, but brought it to the forefront. In the example of our own beloved Prophet Sallallahu we have someone who knew how awkward and discomforting it would be to tell his relatives, his male tribesmen, that the need to honor the orphan, the widow, the needy, and to raise up not to bury their daughters was above that of their own tribal ties. It didn't stop him from doing that because it was the right thing to do. And so too, as Muslims in the 21st century, as humans in the 21st century in America, with all the tools at our disposal, even if we may not be able to do much, what we have, we have uh, mo what most of those who have not uh, been given a voice, who have been silenced have, a voice. So how will and how should we use it?
inshallah we'll conclude with this in the in the second part of the khutbah I say these words of mine, I ask Allah for forgiveness. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. My thanks and gratitude belong to Allah, the Lord of humanity, and I ask Allah to bless and bestow peace on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I need not say much more for the sake of time, but if you take away something for today, take this. It is not wrong or it's not bad to have a conversation with someone, whether of your faith or a different faith, about something that is discomforting or awkward, especially as it pertains to issues of human rights and justice. And more so, let us be mindful to not short anyone respect or basic dignity, regardless of their faith or political persuasion. Bigotry and prejudice have no space in our faith place, and neither does giving a past or saying silent on oppression, even if it's with our friends. So the Prophet ﷺ reminded us that we should help our brother or our sister or our sibling who is an oppressor and help our brother, sister, sibling who is oppressed. And when asked how to do so, because they're both diametrically opposed by helping the one who, the one who is oppressing to stop oppressing the one who is oppressed. So nor is something that like that is this easy. It's something that is difficult. At its root, it is difficult. But it, it would, if it was this difficult, if it was something like uh, that is easy, we probably wouldn't engage in it directly. It's something that, as I mentioned, I struggle with severely, but it's something that we need to, myself first and foremost, need to bring to the first and foremost, the front, because it's not just our conscience, but our faith, because it no longer permits us to remain silent, especially with individuals on either side of the aisle that are uh, experiences, whether they are oppressing or they are oppressed. We have constructed this notion that it's only by agreeing on the superficialities of things that we can have fruitful, genuine, healthy relationships and friendships. But this couldn't be further from the truth. Because like in a marriage, it's the things that you wrestle with, the things that you are uncomfortable with, that you are unsettled with, that bring you closer to the person when you confront them, not ignore them. This isn't just about Palestine or Yemen or Prop B in Austin or mass shootings in the country or any of those in isolation. At the end of the day, as individuals, it comes down to us and what we not only do, can do, but also have done, whether for the causes in our own backyards or to the ones that we are now coming to be aware of. We can always do something at some place, whether in our backyards or abroad. Indeed, as Martin quoted, a time comes when silence is betrayal. Let that time not be now, tomorrow, or ever. May Allah make it easy for us. May Allah make from our previous silence the voice for the voiceless, regardless of our faith, our nationality, our difference, political persuasion, and open our consciences to no longer keep us silent. So inshallah, I hope that this has been a benefit and shall we pray to Allah that Allah allows us the strength for this. Ibadullah, rahimakumullah, inna Allah ya'amuru bil adli wal ihsan wa ita'idhi al-qurba wa yanha'ani al-fasha wal munkari wal baghi ya'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkaroon udhkurullah yadhkurkum wad'uhu yastajib lukum wa ladhikrullah yakbar. O servants of Allah, may Allah be merciful to you. Verily Allah commands you to act with justice, to convert, to confer benefits upon each other and to do good to others as one does to one's kindred and forbids evil which pertains to your own selves and the evils which affect others and prohibits, uh, uh, prohibits revolt against lawfulness. He warns you against being unmindful. You remember Allah, he too will remember you. Call upon Allah and Allah will make a response to your call. Verily in divine remembrance is the highest virtue. We ask Allah to bestow justice, restitution, restoration, and comfort upon all oppressed people and mustadarfun fil ard, especially the Palestinian nation, the Uyghurs, the Rohingya, the Yemenis, the Hazaras, the migrants, the refugees, the persecuted minorities, and the prisoners of injustice, the hungry, the needy, the homeless, the orphan across the world and in our backyard, the environment, the non-human, that which cannot speak for itself. And we pray that Allah corrects those who oppresses and harms each of these, that they may be brought to justice, but that Allah enables us to be facilitators of this correction. Lastly, we ask Allah to make us voices for the voiceless, outspoken for the silenced, liberators for the oppressed, nourishers for the hungry, shelterers of the homeless and refuge uh, and the refugee and advocates for those who are persecuted. And we ask that we are reminded that how we live our lives today 
and what we stand for and fall for will be brought to account, that we will be forgiven for our shortcomings and given the opportunity to show them the right path together. We ask Allah to make this us leave this Jummah better, inshallah, that we came into it. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.